My name is Dr Jasmine Cooper. I'm a research associate at Imperial College London and a steering committee member of the Imperial Lifecycle Network. Uh, today, the network is very pleased to be able to pre present pre Professor Peter Wentke of the Technical University of Denmark. He'll be giving his talk on use talks and after the session, there will be time for a Q&A. If you do have any questions, please type these into the chat function in Microsoft Teams and my colleague, Laura Lander, she will read out questions that people have submitted at the end. Before I pass over to Peter, just a few words about the network. The Imperial Lifecycle Network aims to bring together and connect, sorry, I need to change slides. The Imperial Lifecycle Network aims to bring together and connect lifecycle related research and researchers across Imperial and other institutes, as well as connect its members to the wider lifecycle community. The purpose of the network is to foster collaborations and facilitate networking, as well as to share knowledge and contribute to advancements within the life cycle field. For further information on the network, please visit our website, which is shown on the slide, or consider following us on Twitter. And for any life cycle pra practitioners based in the UK, consider joining the life cycle community uh, UK LinkedIn group. Today's session is the sixth session that the network has hosted since we launched in 2020. And we do have further events scheduled and planned for the rest of this year and 2022. For information on these, please visit our website or look out for our newsletters, newsletters and emails if you are a member of the network. So moving on to today's main event. Today, the network is very pleased to be able to, pre to present Professor Peter Fentke from the, the Technical University of Denmark. He will be giving his talk on use talks, characterizing human and ecological Im impacts of chemicals in LCA. Peter is professor and acting head of section for quantitative sustainability assessment at the Technical University of Denmark. He develops quantitative methods and data for assessing emissions, state exposure and toxicological effects of chemicals and air pollutants with a special focus on integrating consumer, war, worker and population exposure along entire product life cycles. He is director of USTOX, the UNEP slash CTEC scientific consensus model for characterizing chemical toxicity and ecotoxicity. Peter's methods are applied in life cycle analysis, sustainability assessment, risk screening, chemical substitution and cost benefit analysis and inform companies and regulators alike. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, will somehow pass over to you, Peter, when I figure out how this all works. Oh, here we go. Thanks a lot, Jasmine, and for the whole Life Second Network to host uh, this uh, webinar today, the introduction, uh, the wider introduction of use talks to your community. I'm really happy to present this, uh, and I have a wider set of slides, mostly with some background, also technical backgrounds. Uh, to show you something, but also to answer some questions if you have. So I will rush through some of the slides more than through others to give a broader perspective of what use talks is, what is inside use talks. You know, it's not just a black box model, but there is some science in it uh, and how it should be applied and uh, what it is useful for in terms of different application areas. So with that, uh, I jump right into it. And uh, as I understand, you will collect questions, so I will not look at the chat right now, but just uh, grow through my slides. And at the end, we have some Q&A uh, where I will be happy to answer questions from the audience. So let's see how that works. Here we go. So I, my first slide is really an overview of how can use talks be applied? What are the application domains? Originally, use talks is designed to be used in comparative life cycle assessments of products and systems, uh, starting from emissions to human toxicity and ecotoxicity impacts and damages. But since the Green Deal in Europe, zero pollution ambitions, global SDG uh, targets for uh, minimizing emissions, but also exposures to toxic chemicals, use talks actually has explored a much wider applicability domain than just LCA. And some of these things would be high throughput exposure screening. So we have um, done case studies and published all that, of course, also uh, on personal care products where we have really digged into detail for many thousands of chemicals across thousands of products to see, OK, what are uh, the exposure magnitudes and how can they be ranked per chemical product combination? We have food contact materials. We have high throughput risk screening also, where we combined use tox exposure estimates with some hazard quotients uh, for, for chemicals in children's toys, for chemicals in building materials, 
to get a sort of chemicals of concern ranking lists that have been taken up uh, by the way uh, also uh, in, in some regulatory initiatives like in the eco label in Denmark for now. Um, USOX can also be applied in chemical exposure and risk prioritization. So I know some authorities, for example, in, uh, in, in, in Canada, which use USOX for screening which companies should be targeted first uh, that do not comply with some pollution thresholds uh, or national regulatory levels uh, because they cannot uh, pursue, uh, yeah, run after them all at the same time. So, and finally, use talks is also a tool that can be applied in chemical alternatives assessment in Europe, known as chemical substitution under European Chemicals Agency, where you replace harmful chemicals in specific product applications or processes, industrial processes, for example, by more sustainable and safer alternatives. Now, what is Eustox? Eustox is actually a global scientific consensus model. So there had been a many, many year effort started already uh, early 2000s uh, around different models being available for impact assessment, for chemical toxicity and ecotoxicity assessments. Then several research teams, uh, really many, many research teams were coming together and tried to compare, evaluate these models, all giving different results for the same chemical in the same emission context. So to streamline that, they really were striving towards a kind of a consensus, a scientific consensus, discussing pros and cons of different models. And in the end, none of the actual models were was supposed to be superior over all the others. So what they did is took the most important elements across these models where they were actually agreeing uh, among each other and built a new model, and that is the USTOX model, short for uh, a UNEP CTAC uh, uh, toxicity model. It covers uh, human toxicity and so far freshwater ecotoxicity impacts from emissions and chemicals and products. It focuses mainly on organic chemicals, but also on metal ions. It was initiated originally by the UNEP CTEC Leipzig Initiative, where it is still advanced today, which is the final slide that I'm showing what the current progress and process is here. It is currently used in almost virtually all uh, LCIA methods around the world, except uh, less than a handful, uh, and it is uh, actively recommended by the European Commission in the ILCD handbook and the US EPA in Tracy and, uh, and so on. There's a video that I will not show now. You can see that later on yourself to get a little bit more input on that. Now, the Use Talks team essentially has been compiled uh, across people from the Americas and Europe, essentially, uh, after this consensus building process. And this is a team that is still active very much from Tom McCone and Olivier Joliet, that most of you really know, uh, along to Michael Hauschild and uh, Mark Heibrechts, which are all big players in the LCA world already since many years. But we have also included um, in the last years um, specialists on human toxicity dose response modeling, like Professor Wei Xue Chiu. He is in the International uh, Cancer Association in the ARC, and uh, Professor Leo Postuma from RAVM and Radboud University as an ecotoxicologist. Uh, expert. Now we have certain principles around use talks, which is it should be parsimonious, only as complex as necessary, and really simple as possible, and uh, across the whole impact pathway that it models. It should mimic all. It should be. It, it should stay within the frame of the results of all underlying models that have been actually evaluated and led to the development of use talks. It has been cross evaluated against uh, other. Uh, uh, case studies and other models uh, a lot actually over the years and it is as transparent as possible. You have a full documentation, almost 200 pages of, uh, of equations and, uh, and, and compartment descriptions and so on, including a reasoning for the different model choices along the impact pathways that are included in use talks. And that is for me the strong backbone. It is a uh, public available free uh, a model that can really be used as transparently as possible uh, by everyone. So whatever critique comes to use talks, we are always willing to improve it further. It's really a living model. Still, it is stable as a consensus model, so we will not provide every half a year new factors, but rather uh, stay stable over many years until we really make a next major release. More on that a bit later. So what does use talks include? It includes characterization factors. It's an LCIA model, as I presume that uh, most, if not all of you in the call are very familiar with LCA in general. I just dig a little bit deeper into the impact assessment here. And a characterization factor from use talks is expressed as a comparative toxic unit, as a CTU, 
And for human toxicity, that is nothing else but number of disease cases or incidents, cumulative population incidence risk per kilo emitted. And for damage level, it is disability adjusted life years, and it is very common across most uh, LCIA methods for human health related impacts. And for ecotoxicity, it is actually looking uh, also at CTU expressed as potentially affected fraction of ecosystem species exposed over the relevant the compartment volume and uh, residence time of the chemical, again, per unit emission uh, into a compartment. So that's nothing new to you, so I will just jump over that. Uh, it is just quantitatively linking emissions to impacts. How does it do it? It follows a simple impact pathway. Well, it's not so simple. Behind all these metrics that you see on the screen, the fate factor, the exposure factor, and the effect factor, which are the core elements of use talks, is how to link really the different uh, environmentally measurable, more or less, uh, um, items like the emission flow, connecting it to the environmental fate, which is the mass of the chemical in the environment, and we denote that, that relation a fate factor that essentially comes down to a residence time of a chemical in the environment after its release from a specific emission site. The fate, the environmental mass in the environment can be further linked to the exposure where the chemical hits a specific target, be it a human or in that case here, be it an ecosystem in the freshwater, for example, and we denote that relationship ecological exposure factor, because it's a fate linking it to the ecological exposure. And finally, once uh, ecosystems are exposed to a chemical, certain effects can happen here, and that is aggregated into an effect factor linking the exposure to potential effects in the ecosystem. Uh, I come in details to each, to each of these elements. It's a similar pathway for human toxicity. So here we have the same fate factor as you see, I jump back and forth here. So the fate the chemical is not influenced by whether it hits uh, humans in the end or the ecosystems. But what differs, of course, is once the chemical is in the environment, the exposure is very different. For ecosystems, it is expressed mostly as dissolved mass fraction of a chemical in, uh, in an environment like in a freshwater. For humans, it's different. It's really about human intake. So we have different pathways like drinking, inhaling, eating stuff, oral exposure and so on, dermal exposure. So all that needs to be modeled separately. So it's a bit more complex on the human exposure side. And then once humans are exposed at the population level or even individual level when it comes to consumers or, or whatever, then we again have effects linked through an effect factor for human toxicity, linking a certain intake amount to a certain amount of disease cases per year or per day. That's essentially the whole impact pathway that is covered in news talks. It goes a bit further. Effects can, in the end, also be linked to damages on human health or ecosystem quality um, by introducing, typically, for now, a, a fixed damage uh, damage factor or severity factor, as it often uh, is called. For human talks, it would be DALI per disease case, which is different for cancer and non-cancer, of course. And for ecotox, it would be PDF per PAF. So it's a potentially disappeared fraction of species per potentially affected fraction of species. So the damage in the end is expressed for human toxicity as population uh, lifetime loss and for ecotoxicity in terms of ecological species loss. So we have the midpoint characterization factor covering fate exposure effect. That's really the main three factors in news talks. And the damage characterization factor includes also the severity factor here to link it finally to the uh, areas of protection. So far, the whole pathway, that was really in a nutshell, the pathway. I would like to dig into detail now a little bit, starting with the fate. The fate is really the most complex component in use talks, uh, where we have several hundreds of uh, processes and parameters included to understand how chemicals distribute in the different environmental compartments within and among them, actually. So very simply, starting on the fate factor here, what is the bottom line? The bottom line is, the fate factor links the chemical mass in the environment to a specific emission into the same or another compartment. For example, we emit something into air, as you see here, and finally, the chemical, uh, one, one, one part of the chemical that has been emitted stays in the air, another part reaches the water, another part actually accumulates in soil and biota. And that is what environmental fate and use talks is about describing physical and chemical processes, linking these compartments in terms of the chemical mass distribution after an emission. The main 
principle behind that is chemical partitioning. So there are different phases in the compartments, like water mainly consists of the water phase, air mainly of the gas phase, but we also have particles, of course, and dust and whatnot. And we have soil as a more complex uh, medium that consists of a soil matrix, like soil solids, that consists of some biota, of soil gas, and of soil pores, and actually pore water as well. So we have partition coefficients or partition constants like between or octanol, which is a surrogate for lipids or for oily stuff like soil, like cheese, like fish, like humans, actually like human skin and water. So the chemical that is put in water or soil, it will ultimately, after giving it enough, uh, enough time, distribute equally um, uh, between the soil and the water according to its properties, which means if you put it all in water or on soil, it doesn't matter if you wait enough, you will find a certain distribution, a certain mass fraction of the chemical will stay in the soil or move into the soil and another fraction will migrate into the water or actually stay in the water when it was emitted there. So and these are called partition coefficients, which are steady state, concentration distributions, nothing else. So KOW means it's a concentration in the uh, um, um, lipid over the concentration in the water. So if you have a high KOW, Typically, we find the chemical more in soil. If you have a KOW lower than one or even much lower, then we find it more in water. You can make the same partitioning principle and apply it uh, between water and air. Uh, that can also be measured really. So that is the concentration uh, of a chemical in air over the concentration of the same chemical in water. And if it's high, typically for volatile chemicals, we find them mostly in air. If it's very low, we find them mostly in water. Something that cannot be measured is between uh, lipids and air that can be calculated as a simple ratio of KAW and KOW to get the KOA. Now, that is the basic principle. Why is it relevant? Because here you see a, a kind of a plot where we have on the x-axis, again, the KOW, which means chemicals which are on the right side really tend to be found in soil and in biota and in humans. Um, and on the left side here, down here, these chemicals are rather found in the water uh, phase. So they really partition more into the water. And on the y-axis, we have uh, the KAW, which means chemicals found on the, on, on, on the top here are mostly found in air. These are really volatile chemicals. And chemicals down here are typically found in the water again. Now, if you put all that together, we can really see certain pattern of chemicals that are mostly found in water, which are those with low KOW and low KAW. So they do not want to go in air. They do not want to go in the uh, anywhere else but in the water. These are the ones found in box three here. Likewise, we see some chemicals just found in air. They are so volatile. It doesn't matter actually how lipophilic or how, how polar they are. They will be mostly found in the air phase here. And more important is the chemicals in box two, six, and five. These are found in two media, more or less, right? So these chemicals are very, very uh, sol water soluble. So they are found in water, but at the same time, very volatile. So they are also found in air, actually. So these, you find chemicals that are in the same time found in the outer air environment, but also in water bodies. And here we see chemicals that migrate into soil and biota, but likewise stay water soluble. The most important ones that I find really interesting are those in the middle here. Those are the so-called multimedia pollutants that are found everywhere. They have properties that just allow them to migrate and bioaccumulate in biota, go to human skin, go into the soil uh, and, uh, and its environments, but at the same time are found in water, are very relatively soluble and are semi-volatile, so they are found in air and can actually travel long distances and be re-emitted to air, partitioned again to water and back and so on and so on. So that's very interesting and many dioxins, PCBs, PAHs are really found here in the middle, relatively long living substances that are found across all media. Now, why is that important? Because in news talks, we have actually a system of different environmental compartments that are coupled with each other. So we have in the, in the light blue here, all the air compartments. News talks is not a special model. Why not? Because usually in the original LCA context, we do not know when and where a specific chemical is emitted along a certain product life cycle, right? If you have a cotton uh, t-shirt, then um, the original cotton might be grown in Midwest US, 
uh, or in Bangladesh or wherever, where they, wherever they grow cotton, uh, then, then they use some pesticides that might be residues in the t-shirt, so they can be emitted there in the agricultural fields here in the soil. Uh, but maybe some some manufacturing happens somewhere else, maybe in Europe. So another emission uh, of certain chemicals can happen just in a very, very different place and in a different time. So once we don't know that along the whole life cycle, we need still a model to characterize which options of producing the T-shirt is better, right? And for, for, the, for that, use talks was developed as a non-special but nested model. Nested means you have smaller environments like an indoor air half nested inside an, a city like an urban air and half nested in a continental rural environmental air uh, box and the continent here is actually nested in a global box and the global scale box is only there to keep a whole mass balance complete in your stocks so something that is lost here from the continent as you can see that can reach global scale compartments uh, either through the air or also through the coastal marine water that reaches in the open ocean here at the global level. So nothing is really lost on the chemical mass. What's degraded is degraded, of course, but whatever migrates in the water through advection to the ocean or through advection in the air through the global air compartment will be kept uh, included in the mass balance in new stocks. And for that, we have a nested system. So we have in the continental and global scale two different agricultural, two different soils, one natural soil for industrial emissions typically, and an agricultural soil more for agricultural pesticide emissions. And we have a freshwater and a coastal marine water, typically different because of the ecosystems that differ widely between these two. Now, what do we do with that? We have, of course, these arrows here, and these arrows denote chemical and physical processes. That process here from air to water is like deposition. The, this one here is volatilization from the, from the water back into air. This one is advective transport within the air compartment uh, from natural soil to fresh water, could be via subsurface runoff, via leaching through the groundwater column and so on. So each process arrow can include actually different types of underlying processes and all these are described as a function of certain parameters like the partition coefficients that you have seen earlier, but also as function of other things like uh, process velocities like volatilization velocity, like wind speed for advection, like uh, river flow rate uh, for, for advection in water, like degradation in all compartments, and so on and so on. So these are summarized typically as rate constants. We have a rate constant for each process behind each of the arrows there. That is the sum of each underlying uh, physical or chemical process that we have here. SED for sedimentation, DEG for degradation, water to air, and so on and so on. So I'm not going into more detail because you can also see that much later in details in the documentation if you like. What we do with these rate constants, we put these in a mass balance. So we have an inflow, uh, which would be the emission here, that can be taken as input uh, to combine results of use talks, which are the characterization factors with an emission flow. And in use talks, we mainly have the mass in the environment and the rate constants, so the outflow. The rate constants tell us the emission into air or water, where does it go? It goes to other uh, compartments or it is degraded in the same compartment, or we have a global loss. That is essentially what is behind this K here. And what we do with this K, we invert all this, we sum it as you've seen here. So we sum a total K, we have really one total loss per compartment that you have seen earlier for each compartment. And then we invert that. And if we invert the K, the K is really a kind of a expression of what is the time needed to, uh, to, to get rid of the chemical in a certain compartment. And if you invert that, we have the unit of time, which is really a kind of a residence time. How long time does the chemical stay in a compartment? So we can really play with these numbers and get physical meaning behind this fate factor. So the fate factor in the end is nothing else but the residence time if the chemical is emitted in the same compartment. This fate factor tells us how long will it stay there for a certain uh, unit emission. Now, what we do, and that is nothing to learn now for, for, for those of you who have some background in matrix algebra, that's nice for others. You might uh, try to recapitulate, uh, yeah, to, to find it back somewhere in your books. But here we have again our summary rate constant, and we, we invert that. So it's really considered a loss from indoor air towards indoor air. It's a total loss, or it's a process from indoor air 
to outdoor air, which would be advection from I to O, from indoor to outdoor, or which would be the, uh, inhalation if it directly reaches humans, for example, here uh, um, as a loss again from the air. Uh, of the chemical. So things like that, we can all put that in a matrix system, and that is what is behind Eustox. Eustox takes actual physical processes and chemical processes, puts them together in a consistent format, which we denote here as uh, rate constants, chemical mass rate constants, and then puts all these consistently together for its compartments into a matrix system. And that's how we solve the matrix system in the mass balance. So all these Ks are coupled with a mass vector in the environment. And from that, we can derive fate factors and so on and so on. So that was the most complex part. And we have a full day in the Eustock summer school just on the fate usually. But I will jump over that and go directly to the next part. So it's an exposure factor. I started with a human one because it's more complex. So human exposure is in generally the contact between the chemicals and the humans, the chemicals being the stressors, which can induce effects in humans, and humans being the receptors, which can find these effects in their bodies. So how does it work? We see here the chemical in air, in soil, in water, or whatever, and then we have direct pathways through until humans. Inhalation, so we breathe the air compartment itself. So we have a direct contact between the human receptors and the air as an environmental compartment. The same with water. We drink directly the water compartment, a part of it, of course. So that is a direct ingestion pathway from the water compartment to the human intake. When what we then have is the oral exposure is all the indirect part here. So uh, the indirect part from the soil, it can be taken up into the grass, the chemical, from the soil, it is taken up by a plant uptake into some vegetables or whatever, and those are eaten by humans. So it's more an indirect pathway. We don't eat the soil directly, but it goes via other compartments where it can be accumulated or can be transferred through. Even more complex it will be when we look at the animal feed, uh, food uh, for humans, animal-based food, where actually the soil will uh, migrate, the chemical will migrate from soil into the plants that are eaten by the, by, by, by the animals. The animal, uh, inside the animal, the chemical might partition or migrate into specific compartments like the, like the meat, uh, like the milk that's made of it, and then be ingested. So all these are coupled via bioaccumulation factors, which again are just concentration in the meat per concentration in the cow, concentration in the cow per concentration in the grass, and so on and so on. So these are factors underlying also on the exposure side, physical mechanisms that we have here. Um, I will jump over that. I mean, for inhalation, it's inhalation rate times number of person inhaling that in each compartment in use talks divided by the volume. It is the same for the water. So that's relatively clear how we can model exposure. Uh, this, uh, it's a bit more complex when we have the food, as I said. Again, we have the intake rate of a certain item like fish consumption rate times number of persons eating fish divided by the density really here of the, uh, of the fish and the volume of the compartment that it's in, like the water. And then we have a transfer factor. And the transfer factor is nothing else but reflected through the bioaccumulation. How much will end up in the fish per chemical concentration in the water? So these are like partition coefficients, but involve biota. And that is how we can simply express scientifically or mathematically the relationships between what actually arrives at the human in terms of chemical mass in association to what was the original chemical mass in the environment. We can actually aggregate both together. As you remember, the fate factor is a kind of a residence time. So it tells me kilo in the environment per kilo minute per day for example, and if we link that to kilo intake per day, we actually have, when we multiply both factors, kilo intake per kilo emitted. So we have a true mass fraction of the chemical that is emitted that in the end ultimately reaches humans via the different exposure pathways. And this mass fraction was coined to be called the intake fraction in 2002 by Tom McCone, Debbie Bennett, Olivier Joyette, and others. Uh, and the intake fraction is really a meaningful metric because it's a mass fraction. The minimum is zero, nothing can be below zero, and it cannot be higher than one for an, actually up, for an actual uptake of a chemical in humans. So if we look across different chemicals here, we see the actual uh, intake fraction for an emission to air for a certain number of chemicals. And then we see in the different colors what the, uh, the main exposure pathways are. 
And then we see here that we are in the range of E minus six, which would be uh, a um, milligram per kilogram. Uh, so for each kilogram emitted per day in the environment, uh, we have actually a milligram taken up per day in the human population in use talks. So that's really e, uh, 10 to the E minus six is really one part per million or milligram per kilogram, for example. So we see at that range, we have mostly inhalation dominating. So if you have low exposure uh, for, for, for an emission, uh, then typically inhalation is dominant. As soon as we go higher here, we go here into the range of E minus four, E minus three, E minus three being one per thousand, which means we are in the order of gram taken up into the population per kilogram emitted into the environment, which is really huge. And that we find for the more persistent chemicals, which are very lipophilic, which bioaccumulate in fish and in other items and soil and migrate to humans mostly through ingestion here. So the ingestion pathway becomes more dominant for high exposures actually. And that is all for environmental contaminants. We are going here in this range of E minus two or even the percent range of human population exposure, uh, not for chemical emissions in the environment, but rather for chemicals found in consumer products, which is a little bit later that I will talk about. Just uh, jumping quickly to human toxicity and ecotoxicity as the last factor in use tox, the last main element. For the human dose response model, we typically have different points on the dose response. We see here on the x-axis, which is the effective dose that, that, that people are exposed to a chemical. And on the y-axis, we see actually a response. But we don't see humans because we rarely have human data. For, for most of the chemicals. And why is that? Because none of you and me are willing to expose ourselves over, over days or weeks or even years to toxic chemicals. And we have hundreds of thousands on the market globally, right? So we have it for a handful of metals and dioxin and some of that. But apart from these, we have mostly nothing but animal test data. So what we're using, we're using these animal test data uh, and, and try to understand what are the doses uh, that the animals were exposed to, what were their responses, and then link these together in a dose response model. In the original use talks, which is still the formal version today, we used a 50th percentile in the response, which gives us the effect dose where 50% of the animals uh, that have been exposed show an effect over their background. That is effectively how it can be interpreted. Now, what we do then in LCA for simplicity, because the dose response shape that we have seen here is relatively uncertain, and we don't know some chemicals have a shape that is really more S-like, and others are more linear, others again are very different, and humans have wide variability of susceptibility and vulnerability towards chemical exposure. Um, it is very difficult to really estimate what a good fit would look like. And that is why a decision was made many years back to make a linear assumption towards zero from this effect dose 0 0.5 here, uh, where 50% uh, shows um, an effect over background. And that is still the main model today in news talks. However, um, recent consensus building processes and updates in news talks have led to, um, to new models. So we are actually now building uh, or redesigning the whole dose response modeling uh, framework in news talks. We are moving towards nonlinear dose response modeling and we're moving away from relatively high doses that we assume here across chemicals to, mu to, to much lower chemical doses that are more environmentally relevant and that are extrapolated actually nonlinearly following global guidance from the risk assessment community. I will not talk about that today because it is still ongoing and until that is published and fully uh, um, operational, uh, that is something that is still not included in, in, in the current use stocks. Now, the effect factor is simply uh, taking these 50% uh, of affected uh, over background uh, um, um, population fraction and dividing it by the original ED50 that has been translated from animal to human here and uh, looking at population. So we, we just, uh, we take it from a dose per day and multiply it with the body weight and the lifetime of the humans and the days per year to get a lifetime exposure or a lifetime effect estimate really. And that is just a unit correction factor. So in the end, we have this, what we call new stocks in disease cases or population incidence risk. If it's higher than one in a population, we call it a case, typically a statistical case per kilo intake. 
And the kilo intake, as you recall, is the outcome from our intake fraction, which links fate and exposure already together. So it's really relatively simple once we know the process and the numbers to throw in here. The same we do on the ecosystem level with what I'm almost done for the whole impact pathway process, really. On the ecosystem level, we don't look at one species. We really look at the whole ecosystem. So everything from bacteria, algae, phytoplankton, zooplankton, the whole food web in the, in the aquatic ecosystem in that example, until the predatory fish in the end. Ideally, that is what we want to reflect. What is the pressure of chemicals on a whole ecosystem level? So again, the exposure is rather using the whole chemical mass in the water and partitioning it according to the different suspended particles in the water, to the dissolved organic carbon in the water, and through the biota that are in the water where the chemical already partitions into. So we have that to uh, arrive at the truly dissolved fraction of the chemical in the water related it to the total mass in, that was actually arriving in the water from the fate factor. That is what we call the ecological exposure factor in new stocks. There are background information on this in the, in the documentation again. The effect factor we do finally similarly as we do for humans except here this dose response function is not done for one species but actually it's done across species so actually such a curve exists for all individuals for uh, for a single species and then can be put together uh, for all species here we had the daphne and the water flea and that might already show very high sensitivity towards relatively low concentration in the water, as you see here. So we have on the x-axis the log of the chemical concentration arbitrary unit. And then the path is the potentially affected fraction of different species in that water ecosystem that show an effect over background at a certain level. And for example, we can take the, uh, the, the effect concentration by 50 percent of the water flea shows an effect. So the EC50 of the water flea would be at a relatively low concentration. And for an algae, it would be in a much higher, and for a fish, an even higher. From the different EC, EC50s, we can construct a kind of species sensitivity distribution curve, uh, and then actually determine what is the 50th percentile of all the exposed species in the system that show an effect all above their specific EC50. And that's what we call hazard concentration, HC50 because it's really ecosystem level and not species level anymore. Again, in news talks, we make a simplification. We take a linear slope at the 50th percentile here of what is affected in terms of species in the ecosystem down to zero because we don't know again what the true shape of the species sensitivity distribution is. Again, an update is currently in process where we now have 12,000 species sensitivity distributions with their actual uh, uh, SSD shapes, so we know what the standard deviations and the midpoints are. And again, we move down to more realistic environmental concentrations. We move down to EC10s that we can also include more chronic data from NOx and LOx and so on, and then derive not an HG50, but an HG20. In the end, it's the same because we ensure still comparability across chemicals because we apply it to all of them. Still, that needs to be published uh, in, in the course of next year before uh, which it will not be available in new stocks. That was the effect factor in a nutshell. And with that, um, I will perhaps only briefly uh, mention that new stocks has been extended recently. That is actually available and operational as new stocks 3 beta version that you can download from the as a registered user for free uh, on the new stocks website. We have extended that towards chemicals not only emitted along product life cycles, but also uh, combine that with chemicals found in products. For example, in children toys, in building materials, in food contact materials, and so on. That is now a system in use talks that has extended uh, the matrix system and compartments beyond the environmental compartments to also include more indoor compartments and the humans as part of the fate because losses can be done directly to the humans directly. If we put a hand cream on our skin, some part of the chemical directly migrates into our epidermis in before it actually, or instead of actually migrating out into an air compartment. So we have the humans included consistently in the mass balance and we have product compartments included in, in the new use stock system. And I will just briefly just show one or two things how it is done. So the fate factor remains the same. 
but we coupled it, um, the, the rate constants that you see here, the K, which is a process from air to water, from, 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 from chemical in the, in the skincare cream into the epidermis, whatever. We divide that by the total loss from a compartment. And with that, we get a new metric that is now called a transfer fraction. That is very similar to what we have at the intake fraction. The transfer fraction is a mass fraction of the chemical that migrates or transfers from one compartment to another via whatever process. So if you have a transfer fraction of 20% uh, from a chemical that is um, found in a, in, a, in a wall paint indoors that migrates into indoor air, we can actually denote that a transfer fraction of 0 0.2, which means effectively 20% are migrating, volatilizing out of the wall paint into indoor air, for example. So that is relatively straightforward. It's a simple uh, yet very, very clean way to, com to couple emission compartments and chemicals inside products really consistently. We arrive at that again at midpoint and damage characterization factors and all that is actually published uh, as, um, um, as I have shown on, on most of the slides when you just follow the DOI links there. Now, how is it done? You see here we have chemical emissions. You know all this from news talks. So ambient air, water, soil, and then it migrates to humans or to ecosystems. The near field part starts from the chemical mass in the product. So we know a children toy is used here, for example. That's actually uh, the, the kit of a co-author of that publication that, that, that plays with a lot of plastic toys here. So we know how much toy is really used. We know the chemical content, for example, phthalates are used as plasticizers in a specific toy here to keep it really plastic. Uh, and then from that, we have a chemical content in the product. And then we define a submodel in use talks, and that is really new. All these submodels have not been in the original use talks, but will be integrated. They are actually in the beta version already. They are integrated as uh, published individually as new submodels, determining the part from the chemical in the product to its starting point in the environment, like an object interior. That means the chemical is inside the plastic material or inside a wall paint. If it's in, uh, if it's in food and beverages, then, then, it, then, then that would be direct ingestion. Object surface could be a cleaning agent, for example, that we put on a desk or on the flooring material. Skin surface, typically for cosmetics, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is determined, this part, the link between the chemical in the product and the near field environment is done by these submodels that are integrated in use talks. And from there, the original use talks takes over. So from there, it can go again to landfill or it can go to the ambient air by migrating from indoor to outdoor air, where it is not any more relevant what the source was. Does it come from a, pipe, from a wall paint, from a plastic toy, from food contact material? It doesn't matter. Once the chemical is in indoor air, it will migrate into outdoor air, for example. Now it can also deposit here. It can be deposit on the epidermis. When we have direct contact, of course, it will it's really di direct uh, dermal contact. It can also be ingested if you have mouthing and pathways that were, uh, were not uh, or very ill characterized. We developed ourselves with a team of different people under the United Nations uh, Environment Program again. And uh, in this way, news talks is extended to, to many more pathways and many more applications, actually. I will jump over how we do the mass with that. Uh, you can check that yourself later. And these are the six models that we have uh, really data for. Uh, direct environmental emissions, uh, as have been before in use talks. Skin surface for cosmetics, for example. I show you one example what is behind such a submodel. So here you see the submodel for the Arctic interior that was applied also for the plastic toys or for the, um, for the Arctic, uh, for the chemicals in building materials. So here we have diffusion and partitioning again as two main processes that derive uh, under, or that determine where the chemical goes. Once it is in a vanilla flooring, for example, it can volatilize out of the floor into indoor air. For that, it has to migrate inside the material and then it has to partition from the material into the air. And for these underlying complex equations have been developed or published uh, as a function of the velocities of the diffusion and of the partitioning between the different phases and materials in the whole product environment system. Now, that's mainly it for the math and the science in news talks. I have a very brief uh, wrap up on how it is really used and interpreted, which might be mostly interesting. Here you see a screenshot of the matrix system of use talks. So we have a fate factor matrix, an exposure factor matrix, 
an effect factor matrix, and all that is via matrix algebra um, uh, combined into a system of characterization factors. I think you know that because these factors are included in LCA software. You will find that in Asima Pro and Gabi and, uh, and all the other LCA software tools. Uh, this is really the result of the complex system behind your stocks. Now, the uncertainty, of course, they are important for the interpretation, uh, and they usually are very high in your stocks. Tox impacts can be caused by thousands of, uh, of chemicals, really, and we have two to four orders of magnitude uncertainty around each individual characterization factor. That is pretty high as compared to other impact categories. That is what I hear very frequently. What we need to do is we need to put it in perspective. If you have climate change impacts uh, that, that, that might vary across greenhouse gases by a factor 10, then we have typically a factor three uncertainty. That's perceived very low, and it's true. In news talks, we have two to four orders of magnitude, a factor 10,000 maximum here as an uncertainty around the characterization factor. But across the thousands of chemicals that we find out there, the toxicity values, the characterization factors, vary over up to 20 orders of magnitude, which means even with a factor 1,000 uncertainty around some chemical uh, characterization factors, that are six, seven, eight orders of magnitude higher than others in your life cycle study, that is still discriminating. That means even with these high uncertainties, we can still make decisions and prioritize which chemicals to focus on to, for example, refine the underlying chemical data. So it's really relatively seen, uh, it has the same decision power as other impact categories have, because not only the uncertainty is much higher, but also the variability across chem contributing chemicals. Information is uh, the initial model differences were considerably reduced by harmonizing the different components into a consolidated consensus model. We have a relative accuracy uh, within a factor 100,000 for human health, mostly due to the extrapolation from animal data, and uh, between a factor 10 and 100 for freshwater ecotox, and the low end typically for chemicals directly emitted into the water, of course. Use tox falls within the range of all the other models that it has been built on and compared with. And the corrective relation factors are currently in the published version available for uh, roughly 100,000, uh, sorry, 1,000 recommended and 100 indicative. All should be used, but these have higher uncertainty uh, covered. And among them, we have 3,000 in use tox, and two and a half of them have ecotox uh, factors, and a bit more than 1,000 have really. Uh, human tox factors available. The update that is coming up now, we are, we are scaling up to more than 10,000 chemicals on both sides. How to interpret that? That's most uh, almost the last, the last slide here. We can put here on the x-axis the intake fraction, as you remember, linking the emissions to the human population intake. So to the right, it's higher, higher intake per chemical unit emission. On the y-axis, we have the effect factor, which is the, uh, the, the damage on human uh, lifetime loss per kilo intake. So if we combine these, which means uh, chemicals on the, on the top here are very toxic, and chemicals on the far right have very high exposure potential. And if we combine these two, if we multiply effect factor with the intake fraction, we actually go to the top right. Those are chemicals that are both very toxic and have a high exposure potency. So you can really read across this uh, diagonals here that chemicals that are very toxic, like this one, but not have, but not very much uh, exposing people, are equally problematic as chemicals that have less toxic potency because they are much further down on the effect side, but have actually the same order of magnitude higher uh, uh, exposure potency. So that is why they are the equal impact line here, so an ISO line. I like that kind of uh, displaying uh, and, and, and looking at the chemical space a lot. So that's mostly it, um, just further reading. And then we have an update currently uh, ongoing until the next year, where use toxins are one of the deliverables under UNEP CTAC uh, um, um, or UNEP uh, global guidance project uh, for LCIA indicators. Uh, I think many of you know that already. Uh, and here we are actually updating use tox, the near field part, and the human tox, those response nonlinear uh, modeling, and also the ecotox. With that, I say thank you and I'm open for questions if you have some. Thank you very much, Peter, for the informative uh, introduction to use talks.
think we have uh, many questions, so there was a lot of interest in your talk. <laughs> I will just uh, I will just uh, start reading. Um, so, could you please explain what in the long term means for the fate factor, please? Um, what we do in news talks so far is um, we are assuming steady state conditions, which means in LCA, typically, when you have a product system, you have a continuous emission from an industrial site, for example, right, for manufacturing. So we have an every day a kind of a, a small emission amount into a certain environmental compartment, air, water, soil, whatsoever. And that is used in news talks, and we have continuous processes also on the loss side, all our rate constant for degradation and all that are continuous processes. So combining that with the continuous emission and solving the mass balance would naturally give a kind of a long-term equilibrium between how much is lost and how much is actually coming in through the emission pressure. And that is what we call steady state. And uh, use talks solves the mass balance for steady state. We have a dynamic use talks version where we have checked, okay, when is steady state reached? And for organic chemicals, for most of them, that is totally not relevant and steady state is reached very re relatively quickly within a year, for example. Whereas for some metals like lead, for the global compartments like global ocean, um, um, this kind of steady state is not even reached after 10,000 years. So here we have a potential for refinement and we are currently working on publishing that, how, how much that is really relevant for, for which metal and under which conditions. Uh, what are the environmental fate rate constants based on, for example, experimental data, QSAR predictions? Uh, several. I mean, as much as we can, we use, of course, experimental data. The processes are typically not coming from the box itself. The most uh, most uh, environmental processes uh, behind the rate constants for the far field environmental fate and use stocks are coming from from simple box a model that was developed and is integrated even until today in the European chemicals regulation system uses that many of you might know. So that is nothing that was developed by use talks, but just taken uh, taken up from, from decades of developments of how to model runoff, leaching, volatilization, deposition, diffusion, and whatnot. So each of these processes uh, depends on physical chemical properties of the chemical and the environmental compartment uh, characteristics, of course and has been parameterized for different continents and news talks also uh, to reflect different environmental conditions. If you know that your emission always happens in, 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 in the previous years and the next years in a certain environment, you can adapt that in news talks. Otherwise, you go always to the global average. But all that is published uh, in hundreds of papers uh, before news talks even was born, and it's all science-based. Concerning data like food consumption for human exposure or sludge application on agricultural soil for environmental exposure, they are very variable depending on the geographical area. Yeah. How is this variability managed in the model? So that um, there was a publication in 2014, I think, around use talks where different continents and subcontinents and regions in the world have been parameterized based on their uh, statistics for food consumption and other uh, environmental characteristics, for example, to parameterize fate and exposure in new stocks. Uh, of course, if you have uh, really a very sophisticated knowledge about, uh, uh, let's say, continent or subcontinental level system for your LCA or, or, or else, you might override these numbers or introduce a new uh, area in new stocks. But you have to be careful because also processes like sedimentation from water to, from the water column to the sediment underlying underneath the water has been included in the parameterization and would need to be redone if you want to introduce a new uh, a new settings there. Could you give us some information on the last advances about the development of the framework for the assessment of terrestrial ecotoxicity, please? Yeah, uh, so we are looking at that under the GLAM project that you see here on the screen, actually. Um, I must admit that uh, I'm a bit uh, currently disappointed um, how much we can do for e soil ecotoxicity, because mainly there is a big problem with the data. So we have done we have done a half a year work on that to to have to, to look what other data out there for soil ecotoxicity. It's mostly for some pesticides where we have two or three species data available, usually two or three data points per chemical, which is not a lot to build a full SSD, like a species sensitivity distribution, of course. So what we tried then is to look, okay, can we use freshwater aquatic species to extrapolate and predict soil ecotoxicity? And that turned out to be not easy and actually not predictable at all. Um, we have made uh, this link because I know that some of the LCIA methods currently in use, uh, 
they use proxies from, from, from freshwater ecotox to estimate soil ecotoxicity by just using some phase partitioning to the soil pore water. The problem is that species in freshwater are exposed to the water phase. Species in the soil are mostly exposed to the soil matrix, to the soil pore water, but also in the soil gas in three phases. And that is not at all reflected in the freshwater effect data. That means they are very poor predictors. We have used random forest, we have used uh, linear and multiple regressions, and all of them gave an R square of less than 0 0.1. It's very, very poor, which means essentially freshwater ecotox cannot be used as a predictor for soil ecotoxicity. And the data on the soil ecotox are currently not, uh, not solid enough to actually make a broader chemical comparison across many chemicals. So we are still working on that and the next steps, but I cannot really uh, anticipate where we will go with that for now. Thank you. The questions are coming. Uh, <laughs> will the update to the effect factor EC10, HC20 be applied to all substances? Yes, of course. Uh, we want to keep the comparative uh, context in new stocks across chemicals, and that is why we will apply to all of them. We rely here on a very sophisticated, um, I mean, decades long manual curation by uh, soil ecotoxicity experts like Dick van der Meen, Dick de Swart, Leo Postuma, and many others who have uh, really uh, curated hundreds of thousands of individual data points uh, to arrive at NOx and EC10s and EC50s and also. We have hands on to these data and will use them systematically to derive EC10 equivalent data from which we derive then specific uh, hazard uh, concentrations at the 20th percentile for each chemical that we integrate into use stocks. So I think we have time for one last question. Will um, formulants and metabolites of the active ingredients be considered in the future? That's still an open question. I think there are ways that have been proposed how, how that can be done. The thing is that that information is not available for many chemicals apparently. So we have mostly some pesticides where we know that, some others also, but also we don't know in all compartments where they really, um, how, how they transform into other substances. I know that from PFAS, for example, many PFAS are relatively short-lived and degrade into more long-living PFAS components like PFOS and P4, uh, which we should in the end then really characterize. And these are difficult to handle uh, substances for the normal, pesticides that we have already in use talks that is not considered but can be done if you know the fraction that is transformed uh, as a metabolite for example that can be done how it will be handled in the, in the future news talks i don't know yet i foresee we, we need to address that uh, rather sooner than later but i don't know yet in which way Okay, great. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think that brings us to a close for the presentation. Like, I learned a lot and I found your talk really interesting. I'd like to thank all our attendees for coming. I hope that you all found it as useful as I did. Uh, have a good evening to everyone. And yeah, thanks a lot, Peter. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> great, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.